Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! This happened a few days ago and I'm still really in disbelief. I like fishing and my style is mostly done from sandy beaches. It's 5.30 in the morning in early March and of course no one is there. I chose a place near my parking spot so that it would be easier for me to transfer all my fishing gear. Just so you know, fishing with poles in my country is legal in every beach as long as there are no umbrellas but out of courtesy, I never do it in the timeline that normally people swim in, so mostly really early in the morning or after sunset. I started fishing completely alone on a huge beach, 5 km of sandy beach, and it's so relaxing just watching the sun rise, drinking my coffee, listening to the waves and enjoying life. At about 8pm a car parks next to mine. Strange since it was a huge parking lot, but at the same time I was bringing in a fish and didn't give too much attention. Two old ladies came out of the car and came and sat right next to me. Again, we are alone in a huge beach completely empty. I smile at them thinking they probably saw that I just caught a nice fish and they are just curious. Boy, was I wrong. They both started walking towards the sea right in between my fishing poles. Excuse me, can you go like 10 meters away to swim? I'm fishing right here and it might be dangerous for you. We always swim here. One of them says and continues to move towards the sea. Yeah. Yeah. You can swim here. Just go 10 meters left or right from the poles. As you can see, I'm fishing here. The other Karen spoke up as well. She told you we are always swimming here. You should move. But I'm here now. The beach is empty and I'm already set up. Can you please move just a bit to the left or to the right? You shouldn't be here. This is where we swim. And they continue going in the sea right in between of my poles. I look at them as they slowly go in. Not wanting to escalate the situation, I started to roll in one of the poles so that I would go a bit further from them. Afraid that they could get hurt even if the odds of them stepping on a hook was minimum since I threw them about 100 meters away in a depth that they couldn't really reach bottom. Before I managed to finish the first one of them who was in a sea up until her knees, just touched the line of the second one and she started to scream. There goes my relaxing Sunday morning. They both came out yelling at me that they could get hurt and they will call the police because it was illegal for me to be there. And so they do. I told them that I warned them that I was fishing and nothing really happened but they were having none of it. Ten minutes later the police arrived. They went there, almost running as soon as the officers barked and started yelling. I followed them to tell my side of the story. What seems to be the problem here? This man was fishing here while we were swimming and I almost died because of him. You should arrest him, he tried to hurt my friend. How did he try to do that? I was tangled in his line and I almost drowned. Where did you get tangled? Here. She shows the officer her arm. There is no mark or anything indicating that you struggled. She almost died, officer. Arrest him right now, it's your job. The police officer who's now talking to them sees the empty beach. The two crazy old ladies yelling at him, not a mark on them, and they are not even wet, and then he asks me what happened. Well, officer, I was fishing here when these two ladies came 20 minutes ago and sat right next to me. As you see, the beach is completely empty, but they choose to come here because, as I said, this is where they swim. I warned them that I was fishing and they should just go a bit further, but they didn't listen. I started rolling in the poles to eliminate any chance of them getting hurt until one of them just touched the line and started screaming. He's lying! We were here first and he just came and started fishing. I am literally here for almost three hours now. Then something really cool happened. The officer asks which one is my car and which one is the old lady's. I show him my car and he goes there and touches a hood. Then he proceeds to touch the old lady's car. He then returns to us. Do you know that it's illegal to lie to a police officer? Furthermore, accusing someone falsely. Both crazy ladies looked in disbelief. Another officer shakes his head and asks, Why would you do that, ladies? Sir, would you like to press charges? Yes, sir. I would. I responded to him. 
Please, ladies, put your hand behind your back. You are under arrest. They looked terrified and complied. You can see the shame in their eyes and I'm smiling. Thanking God that these officers were so good in their job, it could have been such a different story if someone else was there. So, for the next three to four hours, I was in a police station waiting to give my statement. Smelling fishy and certainly wasn't as relaxing as planned. At least I wasn't arrested. I ended up dropping the charges since I have spoken with one of their kids who was quite reasonable and apologetic but still, that went into the record and probably won't try something like that in the future to me or anyone else after this humiliating experience. Once upon a time, there was me, Jack. I had lost my arm in a tragic accident that happened a few years back. I was working as a construction worker and one day, there was a terrible accident on the job site. A crane malfunctioned and a heavy load of steel beams fell on me, crushing my arm. I remember the pain and the shock of what had just happened. I was rushed to the hospital but unfortunately the damage to my arm was too severe and the doctors had to amputate it to save my life. I went through months of physical therapy and rehabilitation, learning how to adapt to life with a prosthetic arm. It was a difficult and painful journey, both physically and emotionally, but I was determined to overcome it. I was determined to live my life to the fullest. I had a good job loving friends and family and a passion for photography. I felt like I had a pretty good handle on things. I had learned to do almost everything one-handed and even took up photography as a hobby. It helped me cope with my disability and gave me a sense of purpose. One day, while I was out shopping at a department store, my life took a turn for the worse. I was browsing through the aisles, minding my own business when I heard a voice behind me. It was a woman and she was not very happy. I turned around to see who it was and it was a lady and we will call her Karen. She had noticed my prosthetic arm and immediately became very angry and upset. You're taking up too much space. She spat out. You should be ashamed of yourself for being disabled. I was taken aback by her words and didn't know how to react. I tried to ignore her and continue with my shopping but Karen persisted, becoming more and more aggressive. You're nothing but a burden on society. She continued. Why don't you just stay at home where you belong, huh? And cover that disgusting prosthetic arm with your clothes. It's an eyesore. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I had never experienced such hostility and ignorance before. I tried to brush it off, but the more she spoke, the angrier I became. I couldn't let her get away with this, so I decided to confront her. I am not a burden on society. I said firmly, I have a job, I pay taxes, and I contribute to this community just like you do. And I'm not ashamed of my disability. It is part of who I am now. And I embrace it. And I will not cover my arm just because it makes you uncomfortable. Karen's face twisted in anger and she threw her coffee at my prosthetic arm. The hot liquid hit me and it felt like a burning sensation. I was in shock and couldn't believe what had just happened. My immediate reaction was to protect my prosthetic arm and I quickly disarmed it and took it off, holding it in my other hand to dry it as soon as possible so it doesn't get damaged for real. I was worried about the damage the coffee could do to the sensitive mechanics and electronics of my prosthetic arm. Karen, seeing that she had failed to damage my arm, demanded the cops to be called on me for indecent exposure in public, claiming that I had taken off my prosthetic arm to intimidate her. I was in disbelief and couldn't believe that she was turning the tables on me and playing the victim. The cops arrived, took statements from both me and Karen, and examined the footage from the store security cameras. After some time, it was clear that Karen had faked being attacked, and that she had actually been the aggressor. The manager of the store called her out and showed her the footage as evidence. Karen was arrested and taken into custody. I was left shaken and feeling violated by Karen's actions, but I was also relieved that justice had been served. I was proud of myself for standing up for myself and my rights. I knew that there were many others out there who had to deal with people like Karen on a daily basis and I hope that my experience could serve as a reminder that discrimination and hostility towards people with disabilities is not acceptable and that people with disabilities should be treated with kindness and respect. I went home and told my friends and family what had happened. 
They were all shocked and saddened by Karen's behavior. But they were also proud of me for standing up for myself. From that day on, I made a commitment to always speak up when I encounter ignorance and discrimination. I knew that it wouldn't be easy, but I was determined to make a difference on encounter at a time. This happened 20 years ago as I went through basic training in AIT for the Army in 2001. The summer of 2001, I graduated high school and enrolled in the Army. I was shipped off two days prior to my 19th birthday. I arrived at Fort Knox, Kentucky on my first day and what a pleasant present that was. Drill sergeants can be malicious compliance animals, as they are the epitome of by the book and doing what they are told. Fast forward, we are in our BRM phase, basic rifle marksmanship. And after the depressing start of going into hell on my birthday, basic training actually started being fun and PRM was no exception. Being raised on a farm, I already had the basic concepts of shooting down and, though not a natural, I was pretty decent when it came to shooting the pop-up targets. Qualification day came and with basic training being one big competition between everything from squad members to platoons to even companies, the drill sergeants decided to sweeten the pot and give the two top qualifiers a prize of shooting off an AT4. Think bazooka, but smaller. We were all excited and shot our best. Several people shot 40 out of 40, and they had a shoot off for the top two. I only managed 32 out of 40, but was still happy. The two winners are declared, and we gather around for safety brief and instruction block on how to use these. Before firing, you are told to yell, back blast area clear. And that tells anyone in the wake of the concussion of the blast that they should move to the left or right so they are out of the danger zone. The two winners get their 84 and get in position to fire. First kid goes and screams his warning and aims at the old tank 400 yards away. Big boom. Men turn into kids, holler and cheer. Second winner steps up and gets prepared. Looks back, yells his warning and stops. A platoon leader had come up and was standing about 20 feet directly behind the soldier, getting ready to fire. The drill sergeant asks him to move to the left or the right, but he doesn't. He walks back about 30 yards or so and nods his head, indicating that he's good. The drill sergeant doesn't move and yells, Sir, that's not far enough. He tells the platoon leader that the effective back blast area of an 84 is about 100 yards, and that he should move. The platoon leader did not like being given instructions by an enlisted soldier, and since the platoon leader was fresh out of office training, he thought he knew everything. He replies back that he didn't need to be retaught what he had already learned and to continue on with the exercise. To which the drill sergeant nodded and looked at the soldier and said, Carry on. The soldier, now looking very timid and scared, is hesitant and pauses. The drill sergeant approaches and loud enough for everyone to hear says, Did you just not hear the lawful order the platoon leader just gave? Carry on, soldier. The kid swallows, yells back blast area clear one more time, checks his rear, shrugs, aims at the old tank, and fires. The platoon leader was knocked flat on his back as the concussion wave hit him. He got up uneasily and looked up. The drill sergeant gives the all clear, nods at the platoon leader, and grins. The platoon leader burns holes in the sergeant with his eyes, but can barely keep standing as he hopples over to the medic to get checked out. Because of the virus, I have been doing all of our grocery shopping via curbside pickup. I only go once a week on Monday after work and if I forget something we do without until the next week. However, we've had a house guest from out of state staying with us and that has thrown off our shopping schedule. Our guest left yesterday and we had several errands to run today including picking up my partner's car from the shop. We realized that there were a few things that we needed to get us through till the next Monday. I decided to actually go into the store since there were only a few items, less than what curbside would do without a service fee. I got to the store, actually remembering to bring my reusable shopping bag with me for a change. It is rather ugly, light teal colored with some dumb cartoon animals on it. In addition, it's kinda old. 
the clear coat on the outside is peeling in a few places. This makes it recognizable. Because I don't like to bury the bag with my groceries and have to unbury it at checkout, I place it folded over the side of the cart, half in and half out, and I start my shopping. Occasionally, I need to step away from the cart to look more closely at an item on the shelf, or if someone is standing too close to something I want, I will leave the cart for a second, grab the item, and return. It's never for long. I've got the bread and cheese and started over to the produce. I found the things I wanted and as I headed for the spice aisle, I noticed that the bag was missing. Crap. I've dropped it. What was what I was thinking? I started retracting my steps to see if I could find it on the floor somewhere. Or the way back to the entrance. Or I was sure I had it last. And nothing. Not that I was particularly attached to this bag. But I didn't want to have to go back out to the car to get another one. I decided to finish the shopping, see if some employee might have picked it up, and if not, just leave my items loose in the cart and bag them in a the car. As I turn the corner from the spice aisle, I see a woman in the checkout line, early 30s yoga pants and so on, with a suspiciously familiar bag draped over the side of her cart. Exactly the way I hang mine. I looked at it closely, and sure as heck, it is my bag. Me glaring. Oh, I see that you've found my bag that I must have dropped. What? No, I didn't know that was your cart. I snatched the bag off her cart. Verified it was mine, gave her another dirty look. Difficult to do while wearing a mask. and went in search of the milk. I finished my shopping and the clerk at the checkout was a passing acquaintance. They asked. Hey buddy, what was that earlier? Can you believe it? That woman took my shopping bag off my cart when my back was turned. I just happened to see that she had it. Man, I hate people sometimes. No way, some people got real nerves. I completed the transaction and went home. Now, as I sit here typing this giddy with my self-righteous anger, it suddenly occurs to me that there is another explanation, and now I'm feeling guilty. But if an employee found the bag that had legitimately fallen off my cart, picked it up and put it on an empty cart hoping it would be found by its owner. One of this woman needed a cart, saw the one that happened to have my bag on it available, and decided to use it, planning to give the bag to an employee at the checkout. That would make me a total jerk. One of the people I despise so much. Well, I will never know for sure. And I think that's what bugs me most of all. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.